So let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, so it is my uh, great pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce to you uh, today's speaker, Professor Loy Martins uh, from the University of Western Cape in South Africa. Professor Martins got his PhD in 1980, I think, uh, from Cape Town University working with uh, Professor George Ellis. Uh, he has been professors at the uh, University of Portsmouth in the UK and also the University of Western Cape uh, in South Africa. Professor Martin's research spans a wide range of relativistic cosmology, in particular uh, his pioneering work on inflation, uh, relativistic Perturbation theory and dark energy are highly recognized around the world. I am very happy to have him here today and he will tell us about what he has been up to recently. So please. Thanks very much for the kind invitation, Jayu. I hope I can live up to that. I'm sure I can't. Uh, today I want to talk to you about a topic which I've been working on with a number of postdocs and students, two postdocs, Xian Jolikua and Urbina Ume, and PhD student, Elena De Viert, as well as with my colleagues, Chris Clarkson and Stefano Camera. And this is about the, the dipole of the galaxy bispectrum. So I'll take a while to explain what that is, I'll build up to it and then tell you what we have done and plan to do with this property of the galaxy by spectrum. So if we just start by setting the scene about galaxy surveys, which are coming in the next generation editions, I'm thinking particularly of spectroscopic surveys for the purposes of this talk. So surveys like Euclid, uh, the LSST or the Rubin Observatory, what its new, new name is, and the square kilometer array in the radio, these surveys are typical of the next generation properties that the matter distribution in three dimensions will be mapped across huge volumes of the universe, wide sky areas and deep redshift reach. So of course, because of these huge volumes, um, these surveys will be able to probe the dark sector of the universe with incredible precision, measuring dark energy and dark matter parameters and testing models of these, of the dark sector and their possible modifications to even higher precision than, than we've uh, recently seen in BOSS and EBOSS. But I'm, my talk is not about that, as important as it is, that's obviously the most important thing about these surveys. But there are also new discoveries waiting to, to be made. And the one that I would focus on is the fact that these surveys, by virtue of their large volumes, will be able to deliver new probes of the universe since they are going to be accessing ultra-large scales, fluctuations on ultra-large scales. And when I say ultra-large scales, I mean scales beyond the equality scale in the power spectrum. The current surveys have more or less got close to the equality scale, but not beyond it. We haven't yet confirm the turnover in the power spectrum, for example, and that in itself will be an interesting development. So what I'll talk about relies on the fact that we can access ultra large scales. Well, I'm interested in the redshift space galaxy power spectrum. So of course, the most important feature of redshift space is the, the standard Kaiser redshift space distortion effect. Uh, and this arises from the fact that galaxies are not observed in their real space configuration, but in redshift space. And due to peculiar velocities, this distorts their positions and as a consequence, the, the fluctuations. So if we look at a mild overdensity on the left panel here, which where we have four typical galaxies falling in towards the center of that mild overdensity in real space, if we think of a spherical, perfectly spherical overdensity, what we're actually seeing in redshift space is, is a flattened ellipse of reduced volume, but the same diameter, because we don't have any peculiar velocity distortions transverse to the line of sight at first order. 
and we have the maximal distortion radially along the line of sight. And because the peculiar velocity is away from us here, the redshift is higher than we, than uh, the Hubble redshift, and here it's lower. So we have the squashing effect. And the redshift perturbation that we're talking about is determined by the peculiar velocity vector V scalar product with the direction of observation N. So it's maximal along the line of sight and zero transverse the line of sight. So this, is, this has been known since Sargent and Turner in 1977, but more often associated with Kaiser in 1987, that the real space galaxy density contrast, which is just the galaxy bias times the matter density contrast, is corrected by the Kaiser factor, which is, involves a radial derivative of the radial velocity. And so in Fourier space, this translates into B1 being replaced by B1 plus F mu squared, where F is the growth factor, the rate of growth of density perturbations, matter density perturbations. And mu is the cosine of the angle between the Fourier vector K and the observation direction N. And consequently, this leads to the power spectrum with the square of the factor here times the matter power spectrum. And the squashing effect that we see in rich of space translates in Fourier space into the emergence of a quadrupole and hexadecapole in the galaxy power spectrum. Now, in fact, there is a subdominant relativistic correction to the Kaiser effect. And I'm going to call this the leading order relativistic correction because it scales like the Hubble rate over K, one, one power of H over K. So this, this is a Doppler type relativistic correction, which arises directly from the rate of perturbation that I mentioned a few slides back. It was actually known in the, the Kaiser paper, it was pointed out, but it wasn't properly computed or completely computed. I think it was first uh, properly analyzed by MacDonald in 2009, partly using a paper that he'd uh, produced with Jail in that same year, and then also by Jail himself and by Chalinor and Lewis in, uh, in the years 2009 to 2011. And this correction is basically of the form some coefficient a, some background coefficient a times the radial velocity itself. So you can see it's, it's subdominant relative to the Kaiser because the Kaiser has a radial gradient and gradients will amplify the measurability of a quantity, whereas there's no gradient here. And in Fourier space, you immediately, because of the um, the fact that it's just the radial velocity itself rather than its gradient, you pick up an imaginary correction to the Kaiser factor in Fourier space. And as I mentioned, this factor goes like 1 over k because of the absence of the gradient. This gradient here will kill that 1 over k. So what we're doing, sorry, what we're doing, as I've said here, we're neglecting higher order terms, those of order h squared over k squared. And because I'm working in Fourier space, I'm also neglecting lensing. So the basic idea as to where these two terms come from is illustrated by considering the co-moving radial distance r. In redshift space, the observed r is evaluated at the observed redshift, which is the background redshift plus the perturbation. And if we tailor expand that as the background co-moving distance plus delta Z times dr by dz bar. And this factor we know is one over H, the Hubble, the Hubble rate. So we can see immediately that because delta Z is proportional to V dot N, this is a V dot N correction. Now, when we move from real to redshift space, we have a Jacobian, which in, involves essentially the derivative of R obs with respect to R which we can see involves a one from here and the standard Kaiser term when we take the derivative of V dot N. But if we take the derivative of the one over H, we get an extra term. 
So that's the basic idea there. It misses some terms because it's not the full picture, but it gives you a basic idea as to where those two terms come from. If you do a full calculation, the factor A, as well as having the H prime over H squared, which I illustrated in that simple argument, has a, a further set of factors, which I will explain as we go along. First of all, we have a minus two over RH, where R is the co-moving distance, uh, co-moving radial distance. And then we have what we could call the evolution of the co-moving density. So NG is the co-moving galaxy number density, the bar saying it's in the background. And if the number of galaxies, the co-moving number density of galaxies is conserved, this would be zero. So this quantity here tells us to what extent the galaxies that we're looking at deviate from being conserved, for example, through mergers. So any real galaxy survey, this will not be zero. And the second term here is a magnification bias term. So here is essentially apart from a sign, this is the magnification bias. And it comes with a factor one minus one over RH, which I'll explain shortly. So we introduce, as well as the cosmological terms in the first two terms here, we introduce tracer dependent terms here through the evolution bias BE, B evolution. And the magnification bias Q, many people use S as an alternative, they're related by a simple factor of five over two. So this slide then asks and answers the question, why do we see magnification bias in a Doppler term? It sounds counterintuitive. Well, the origin of that is the lensing convergence itself. I don't have time to explain this, but one you, sh you should be aware of, or unless you already know, that the number density contrast is affected by lensing convergence. So the density contrast delta G is replaced by delta G plus a term reflecting how number counts are affected by lensing. And the term has got a factor two times Q minus one, where Q is the magnification bias, and kappa, which is the lensing convergence. This minus one comes from the fact that lensing magnification in increases solid angles, so it dilutes the density of galaxies. But the Q works in the opposite direction, if you like. This takes of the account, account of the fact that some galaxies are lensed into the survey's detection and all lensed out of it by under densities. So there's a battle between lensing of galaxies and lensing of the solid angle. Well, the point here is that the lensing convergence itself has a Doppler correction, which arises from the redshift perturbation. And this was pointed out by Bonvin et al. in 2005 and examined in detail by Bonvin in 2008. So the, the lensing convergence consists of the standard term that we all know. This is the line of sight integral over the matter density with the lensing kernel times some normalizing factor, but it has somewhat like the number counts of galaxies, it has a Doppler correction due to the fact that the uh, area distance or the luminosity distance in the background when measured at the observed redshift gives you a correction, a first order correction of the, exactly the same form that we've seen for number counts, but with a different coefficient here. And you can see this coefficient here accounts for the coefficient that I had in the previous slide. So that is where the uh, magnification bias enters the Doppler term. Now the question is, with a complex uh, number density contrast in Fourier space, is the power spectrum complex? Well, we all know that the standard power spectrum must be real. And if we work out delta K, delta minus K, by I'm enforcing homogeneity here with the direct delta, because the cosine factor mu swaps sine when K goes to minus K, the I and the minus I give us a plus here. And essentially we have a real power spectrum. 
And you can see that the, the, the H over K behavior in the density contrast becomes H squared over K squared in the matter power spectrum. So it's, it's moved beyond the leading order. And we could say that at leading order in the auto power spectrum, the Doppler term uh, disappears because it actually only affects the next to leading order. However, as pointed out by McDonald in 2009 and Bonvin et al. later, who investigated the measurability of this phenomenon, if we cross correlate the power spectra, the, if we take the cross power spectrum of two galaxy counts, two different traces of the underlying dark matter distribution, then the imaginary part no longer is zero because that cancellation no longer happens. And in fact, you can show that if I have galaxy survey G and galaxy survey G tilde over the common volume of the universe, common redshift reach and common sky area, then the galaxy power spectrum has a real part with its Doppler one over K squared correction and an imaginary part. This imaginary part is no longer zero unless the biases are equal and the A factors are equal. So if the survey, if the traces properties, the clustering bias, the magnification bias, the evolution bias are different, then you're going to have an imaginary cross power spectrum. And if you work to leading order, you can neglect this H squared over K squared term here, but the red term here is still at leading order. And so it follows that this is going to be more likely to be measurable in the cross power spectrum than in the auto power spectrum. And I'll come back to that point later. And the important point to note, as well as the fact that this is an imaginary correction from the leading order relativistic effect, is that it generates a dipole, which is imaginary. And you can easily work out this dipole and it's, it's just slightly different from that factor the mu's get integrated over. It's because we have a mu times mu squared. In other words, we have an odd power of mu that we get an odd dipole. In this case, L equals one. There's also actually an octopole, which is smaller, which I won't discuss. So just to emphasize once again, this relativistic effect that we're talking about in the cross power spectrum is less suppressed than in the auto power. And it turns out, as shown by Bonvin and collaborators in 2013 and later papers, that this is detectable via two traces in uh, next generation surveys. And potentially even in some current surveys, although I'm not sure about that. So let's move from the power spectrum to the, the galaxy bispectrum, the topic of this talk. What about the bispectrum of a single galaxy survey? I'm not going to talk about multiple traces in relation to the bispectrum. So in order to look at the galaxy bispectrum at tree level, we have to go beyond first order up to second order in the number density contrast. Uh, and at first order, we have our relativistic correction to delta G, which I call delta GD, where D stands for Doppler type, which is A times V dot N. What about at second order? Well, this was worked out in our paper 2018 and has subsequently been worked out by others. And it's also, you can find it buried in some earlier papers by Jaiul and others, but I think we explicitly isolated this term uh, in 2018 for the first time. And you have a series of terms here. It's actually remarkably simple. It's not that complicated, but before I go into the details of these coefficients A, C, and E, well, A is the same one, we know that already, but two new coefficients. Let's just identify the types of terms that are coming in here. Well, first of all is the obvious term, which is the first order term promoted to second order. It's the so-called pure Doppler term. And that is always going to be there at second order. The, sub, the remaining terms are quadratic terms. In other words, they're first order times first order terms. 
and they are the following type. Here we have Doppler times density, V dot M times the density, Doppler times RSD. Now we have the gravitational potential times the gradient, the radial gradient of the density. We have the Doppler times the radial gradient of the gravitational redshift. The gravitational redshift is dr phi. Here we have the gravitational potential times the gradient of the RSD. And finally, we have a term which involves the transverse velocity. I mentioned earlier that the transverse velocity doesn't affect the redshift space distortions at first order, but at second order, there is an effect. The transverse velocity comes in here. So it's not that complicated. It's not simple, but not that complicated. So I've just writ, I've repeated it in the next slide here, but just also now shown the, the coefficients A, C, and E. We've seen A already, but I've highlighted in red the terms that are tracer dependent. The evolution bias, the magnification bias, the clustering bias B1, and its derivatives with respect to redshift and luminosity. Right, so we now have the tools with which to compute the bispectrum at tree level. Uh, let's move on to that. So if we consider the three-point correlation function at tree level delta G, delta G, delta G2. So if there's no superscript here, that's first order and the second order is marked with a two in brackets. In Fourier space, that gives us the Fourier space bispectrum BG, which is basically the square of the power spectrum times some kernels, first order kernels and a second order kernel. And then with cyclic permutations to, to preserve all the symmetries inherent in the, in the bispectrum and in the three point correlation function. So at first order, the kernel is simply multiplicative at second order, it's a convolution of two matter density contrasts with a Dirac delta just to enforce the convolution, the rules of the convolution. So in the Newtonian approximation, those of you who are familiar with the galaxy bispectrum would know these expressions. Those who aren't, well, you can recognize the first order kernel is just the Kaiser uh, term that multiplies the first order galaxy density contrast. And the second order kernel has the galaxy bias at first order and at second order, the linear and quadratic galaxy bias. And this F2 here just takes care of the delta times delta. So this is B1 times delta squared. And this is, sorry, this is B1 times delta two, this two here. And this is B2 times delta squared. Here is the kernel for the tidal bias, which, which we include in the Newtonian bispectrum. And then finally, the second, sorry, the second order Kaiser term has a pure second order velocity contribution where G2 is the velocity kernel. And then quadratic order one times order one RSD terms. For example, RSD times density. So that's the Newtonian galaxy bispectrum, which is well known. The relativistic correction to BGN, would, I'm calling it BGD, the Doppler type correction. The Newtonian parts, I'm just writing it down again here so that you can see it. And now the Doppler type relativistic part involves relativistic kernels coupled to Newtonian kernels. There are, of course, pure relativistic kernel contributions, but they are beyond leading order. So the leading order involves Newtonian coupled to relativistic, Newtonian coupled to relativistic. So if I have a two relativistic terms coupled to each other, then I would be at beyond leading order. So at leading order, this is what the relativistic correction simplifies to. It's obviously a bit more complicated looking than the Newtonian part, and, and but actually in the num terms of the number of terms, it's not that much different because we're working to leading order. 
So if I just come back to these kernels, I haven't yet shown the first order kernels and the second order kernels in the relativistic form. Well, this one is obvious from the first order uh, galaxy density contrast. We've already seen that. And the second order one just is just the Fourier space translation of the delta G second order, which I discussed a few slides ago. Here you can see your coefficients A, C, and E, and various terms which arise from the Fourier translation of that second order Doppler type contribution to the galaxy number counts. Now the important thing is, as you notice here, there's an imaginary unit I multiplying both KD and KD2. And so the relativistic correction to the bispectrum at leading order is purely imaginary. Very much like the cross power spectrum relativistic correction, but now we're having a single tracer and in the bispectrum, we also have an imaginary contribution. There is no symmetry that forces the galaxy bispectrum to be real in Fourier space. And also note, as I've already mentioned, but to make it explicit, just like the Newtonian bispectrum, the relativistic correction goes like the square of two matter power spectra. But instead of scaling like, just like P squared, which is what happens with the Newtonian part, it scales like I times H over K at leading order. So if we move from the imaginary, if, if you now accept that, or at least will tolerate the fact that my claim that the galaxy bispectrum has an imaginary correction due to the leading order relativistic effect, then it follows that the galaxy bispectrum should have an imaginary dipole. And this is what turns out to be the case. So the multipoles of the galaxy bispectrum may be defined by integrating the galaxy bispectrum against a spherical harmonic complex conjugate using mu1 and phi as the variables for your spherical harmonic decomposition. If you refer to this diagram here, here the red triangle is the closed three triangle for the K vectors in the, in the galaxy bispectrum. It's closed in order to preserve homogeneity. Theta one is the angle between the observation direction and K one. And mu one is the cosine of that angle. So this is where the mu one comes from. And var phi here is the angle of the projection of N onto the XY plane made with the X axis. There, there are other ways of choosing your coordinates but uh, this, this is a standard choice which, which I'm making here. So if we make this decomposition, we can show the following. The monopole and quadrupole remain exactly as they are in the Newtonian approximation, because at leading order, these are not affected by relativistic corrections. They are only changed at subleading order, next to leading order. So at leading order, the dominant quadrupole and, and monopole are given by the standard forms. There's no Doppler contamination, no relativistic contamination at leading order. But in addition to this, there is a non-zero dipole which occurs only when there are relativistic corrections. There is no dipole in the Newtonian approximation. It's imaginary and it is therefore, the fact that it vanishes without the relativistic contributions, it's a smoking gun signal of the presence of relativistic corrections in the galaxy bispectrum, which makes it potentially quite interesting if, like me, you're interested in such things. So let's just have a quick look at some example plots for the monopole versus the dipole. Uh, for my first example, I've chosen isosceles triangles which are becoming increasingly squeezed as we go to the left here, as K3 goes to zero in the plot. The squeezed limit is K3 is zero. So if you, the black curve here shows us the Newtonian monopole, which is real. And the red and blue curves 
give me two components of the dipole, the magnitude of them. It's imaginary, as I've said, and it vanishes in the Newtonian approximation. And you can see that B11 is largest in the squeezed limit and becomes potentially quite significant beyond the equality scale, which is around about 10 to the minus two here. Uh, this example is just chosen at redshift one for an SKA phase one intensity mapping survey. If I look at another example of, instead of squeeze triangles, flattened triangles, also isosceles, but flattened, becoming increasingly flattened as we go to the left in this angle theta, you see the little triangles above here showing you how it's becoming increasingly flattened. And here is the diagram and the, the two modes, K1 and K2, are now 0.01 as opposed to 0.1 previously. In this case, it is the B10 which is larger than the flattened limit than the B11. And again, it's becoming potentially quite significant on large scales. You notice also that the uh, the vanishing of the dipole in the equilateral limit. That's a general property. By the way, here I'm using for a variety, a Euclid survey at Z equals one. Um, can I ask you a question? Please go, shoot ahead. Yeah, uh, can, we, can we go back to the isosceles configuration? So if we go further, to the squeeze limit, like K3 goes to like 10 to the minus four. Mm -hmm. B11 will be larger than B00 and stay constant. It will, it will be larger than B00, yes. Okay. But so it carries on, it flattens off slightly, but it doesn't actually stop. It doesn't turn over. So it stays constant? Uh, not really, it, it grows very slowly. Very slowly, let's put it that way. What, what happens if we set K3 to zero? Uh, oh, this is a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> so first, first of all, I should say that as, as we go beyond say 10 to the minus three, or you, you know, as we start getting smaller and smaller, we then can no longer neglect the H squared over K squared terms. Right, that's right. Yeah. And in fact, there are also H squared over K, H cubed over K cubed and H to the four over K to the four in the galaxy bispectrum. Right. So we get a whole host of additional terms which can no longer uh, be neglected. And so you can't, you can't really make any safe deductions about what's happening on the very largest scales. Okay, thanks. Okay. So sorry, this, this then was the Euclid survey. So there was just two particular examples. And in both of those surveys, I will be talking about the actual signal to noise uh, very shortly. But just to, to, to recap then, by using two different examples, I've just illustrated that the two components of the dipole, there are only two because B11 is equal to B1 minus one two components of the dipole can behave differently in different configurations. B10 dominates the flattened case and B11 dominates in the squeezed case. And I also just pointed out in passing, but let me repeat, that in the equilateral configuration, the dipole vanishes exactly, and that's a general result, which is true. It's quite an interesting result, actually. Right, so those curves, those plots suggest that there may be a chance of detectability. Now let's actually investigate that more quantitatively. And let me remind you that in the auto power spectrum, this Doppler correction, the, in other words, the leading relativistic correction is not detectable. Well, I'll remind you that it scales like H squared over K squared. And as a result, it's not detectable even in next generation surveys. Uh, this was shown in a number of papers, but I'll just cite the one that I know myself from 2015, to Alonzo et al. Uh, not possible to detect this term in single auto power spectrum analysis. But the auto bi spectrum, as we've seen, is less suppressed by one power of k to the minus one. At leading order, the relativistic effect is going like h over k times p squared. 
And the reason for this is that the bias spectrum couples short Newtonian and long relativistic modes. Right? I'll just remind you that wherever you see the red relativistic mode, it is coupled to Newtonian modes. Here the Newtonian mode is second order, here the Newtonian modes are first order. So because of this coupling of the long mode to short modes, which can't happen in the power spectrum, because the modes are independent, this is what is giving us a suppression, a less suppression of the relativistic effect than in the power spectrum. Well, is it detectable in principle? So I'm not going to be doing a full-on analysis of real data. Obviously, I'm doing simple Fisher forecasting for future surveys, just to indicate whether it's worth trying to pursue this or not. So we start, start off with a simple stage four forecast. And strictly, I shouldn't call this Euclid. I should call it Euclid-like. So let me say Euclid-like. Uh, what I'll be doing for the simple forecast is just assuming the best fit cosmological parameters from Planck 2018, because those parameters will be determined by the Newtonian analysis of the power spectrum and the bias spectrum, and not the concern of the relativistic effects that we're talking about. And if we choose a, the flagship stage four survey of Euclid, the spectroscopic survey using the latest specs, the model three from Pozzetti et al, for those who you know these details. The co-moving number density is the luminosity integral over the co-moving luminosity function and the model three luminosity function is given by this rather nasty looking form. It's a broken power law. And if we do the analysis, we find that the co-moving number density between the redshifts of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 down to 1.8, the redshift range of Euclid, uh, looks something like this. In, term, in units of h cubed over megaparsec cubed. So obviously we need that for our forecasts. And we need to differentiate the luminosity function with respect to redshift and with respect to luminosity and evaluate at the luminosity cut. And this is what we get. For the evolution bias, which is negative, it becomes less negative, but it's still strongly negative. And the magnification bias, which is always positive, ranges from just below two up to just above 2.6. So I should just say in passing that setting BE zero and Q zero is very, very unphysical and can lead to quite large changes in your signal to noise. So if we put those ingredients into a Fisher forecast analysis, we find the cumulative signal to noise ratio as we go th through the redshift range of Euclid, ending up at 17, around about 17. So let's, let's just be less optimistic and say it's order 10. It seems to be safely the case that this is in principle detectable and is worth investigating further. So that's quite encouraging. And I'll end off by just discussing the case of line intensity mapping, since I've already seen an example of that and we've mentioned SKA. What about 21 centimeters intensity mapping surveys? Well, these surveys essentially give up the task of trying to detect individual galaxies and simply detect the integrated 21 centimeter emission of hydrogen atoms in all these galaxies to give us the large scale fluctuations in galaxy numbers with poor angular resolution, but with enough cosmological power for many um, constraints in cosmology. So this is what an intensity map looks like. And this is what a galaxy detecting survey looks like, uh, roughly speaking. The positive uh, aspect of the 21 centimeter case is that we have simple, very simple evolution bias and magnification bias. So the evolution bias is directly determined by the background or average brightness temperature. And the magnification bias is one. So that simply knocks, it simplifies the, the coefficient A quite dramatically. 
On the negative side, the signal is weakened by the fact that 21 centimeter signal is plagued by foregrounds which have to be cleaned, so that removes some part of the long wavelength signal, and also by the telescope beam, which removes part of the small scale signal. So you get hit on your large scales where the relativistic effect is, and on your smaller scales where the Newtonian effects that couple to it are. So we would expect not to be as good as a spectroscopic galaxy survey. And that is what we find. Now, 21 centimeter surveys come in two types. The one is using single dish mode mapping, and that's where you simply add up the sync signals from all the dishes independently. And examples of that are the SKA uh, one intensity mapping survey and two frequency bands, and the Meerkat, proposed Meerkat intensity mapping survey, which is also a next generation survey. And we can see from the, the red and the blue curve are the two bands of SKA, and the green and the black are the two bands of Meerkat. Meerkat gets a signal to noise up to about three when you combine the two bands. So it's just marginally maybe detectable and probably not therefore. For SKA combining the two bands, we get above six. So it seems that we could say that the signal was possibly detectable. The other type of 21 centimeter survey is an interferometric survey in, in interferometer mode where we combine the signals from the dishes. And the difference with the single dish case is that you probe the smaller scales better and the larger scales worse. So there's a trade-off. We're going to get more Newtonian signal and less relativistic signal. So if we look at HIRAX, which is a proposed interferometer mode survey that will be based at the SKA site in South Africa, it is giving us a signal to noise roughly the same, slightly smaller than SKA1. I've got the three different cases, blue, red, and black correspond to a parameter NW, which is zero, one, and three. And this, this NW accounts for the loss of signal due to the foreground wedge, which exists in interferometer mode. NW equals zero is the op very optimistic case. One is more realistic and three is quite pessimistic. So we choose the red one, the, the intermediate case, and we can see that the survey on the right here, the Puma 5000 survey, uh, gets a signal to noise, which is a bit smaller than, but not far off that of Euclid. Now, unlike, unlike Hyrax and SKA and Meerkat and Euclid, which are all going ahead, Puma is still only a proposal. And the, the futuristic full proposal for Puma is a 32,000 dish, which would obviously give a very good signal to noise. But that's a little bit like SKA phase two and Puma phase one uh, perhaps has a chance of going ahead, but as far as I know, it's still not yet, um, it's still just a proposal, still not yet approved. But it's interesting that Puma itself is kind of comparable to, to the Euclid. So that brings me to my final concluding slide here. Let me just make a brief summary. Uh, I've tried to show you that the leading relativistic correction to the retrospace space galaxy bispectrum in Fourier space generates an imaginary dipolar contribution. And that in principle, it should be detectable by next generation spectroscopic surveys. Of course, there's also an octopolar, an octopole, but I didn't mention that because it's typically smaller than the dipole. However, as I'm on that point, I forgot to make this point earlier. Our signal to noise does not rely on the dipole. It simply takes the whole imaginary part of the galaxy bispectrum. So it actually does include the octopole and the L equals seven pole, which also exists in, in the uh, relativistic case. My second point is, is just to repeat that if we use data from the CMB, supernovae, and the full shape of the power spectrum and bispectrum in a Newtonian analysis, together with weak lensing, 
in next generation surveys, this will determine <clears throat> the cosmological parameters, the growth rate and the biases, independently of the relativistic correction that I'm talking about. <clears throat> So that it's, it's the relativistic correction is something to be measured on top of those things which will already be determined or in the process of being determined. The relativistic part of the galaxy bispectrum depends on the evolution and magnification biases and also on the clustering bias derivative with respect to luminosity. So in other words, we need measurements of the luminosity function together with simulations in order to give us uh, good estimates of BE and Q and also of the, I didn't mention this in the bullet point here, but also of the luminosity dependence of the linear bias B1. Errors on BE and Q will clearly degrade this, the SNR, but ultimately the luminosity function itself will be measured. And my final point is, is, is a cautionary um, disclaimer. I have used the plain parallel or flat sky approximation in Fourier space, which is typical of most uh, analyses in Fourier space. But as a consequence, I'm excluding wide angle effects, which will uh, contaminate the, the um, relativistic correction that I'm talking about. And this needs to be addressed. And the reason I haven't addressed it is that it's technically extremely challenging. And it's something that we are working hard on. Even in the case of the power spectrum, the inclusion of wide angle effects is pretty subtle, but it's much more developed than it is for the bispectrum. So this is ongoing work. And it's probably the major theoretical issue there are other theoretical issues and I'm sure they'll come up in questions, but this is the major one in, in the Fourier context. And that's where I'll end. So, um, thank you very much, Roy. That was very, very nice. So Jail, should I take the questions? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So do we have questions? Please raise your hand in the, if you know how to raise your hands. Yes, we have a question. Please go ahead from Nastasha. Hi. So first of all, thanks a lot for this really, really nice talk. It was very nicely explained. Um, yes, we got the theoretical issues. So um, yeah, you already said you ignored wide angle effects because yeah, as we know, they're very difficult. Um, you also ignored um, some terms. So you ignored one of our k-squared terms. Um, and then you said you also ignored all, so, so you ignored lensing terms evaluated along the line of sight. And um, again here, I mean, we know that they're very difficult, um, but so is this the only reason that you did not um, include them, that they're quite difficult to include, or um, are they not um, relevant for some reason so from your point of view? Um, yeah. You mean the lensing term? Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah, okay. So I believe that you have a paper with Gile in which yeah. you can put lensing in. I, I, I have to learn that paper. In fact, I, I need to speak to the two of you and others to. Okay. That okay. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's something on my list to have a, a much, a, a, have an attempt to do it using what I understand of your formalism, but I don't understand it properly yet. So I think before your paper, I, my answer would have been you can't put lensing into Fourier space. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, yeah, so I was very surprised to see your paper. <laughs> okay. The, the way okay. around it, the best way around that would be to use the angular bispectrum. Now, the angular mm -hmm. bispectrum naturally is full sky. It naturally includes all wide angle effects. It naturally includes lensing, everything you want. Unfortunately, it's enormously computationally challenging, even to include Kaiser RSD in the tree level angular bispectrum is numerically horrendous, which is quite bizarre because if you go into Fourier space, 
the Kaiser redshift space distortions are very easy to deal with, very easy, trivial. Go into angular harmonic space, they become a nightmare immediately, especially if you have a, a window function. It's an absolute nightmare. So unless people can come up with ways around the angular bi spectrum, like people have been doing with the angular power spectrum, speeding up the numerical integrations and so on, I think that the ideal solution is, is beyond reach currently. So we do need fixes like the ones that you propose or, or we need to go to the three point correlation function um, using some other kind of tricks where, where one can also include lensing. What I have done here, what we've done here is, is to consider only autocorrelations so that the lensing effect is is naturally a little bit smaller than it would be if you included cross correlations across significant redshift differences. So since we didn't include cross correlations, we, we can kind of argue that part of the lensing effect is not relevant to us because we didn't include the long redshift correlations anyway, but it's, it's, it's not satisfactory, I agree. It's just it, the, the basic answer to your question is it's technically extremely challenging. And similarly for wide angle, I think the wide angle is less challenging. I would have thought the wide angle is less challenging than the lensing, but um, I'm, I'm finding all sorts of surprises, so I shouldn't say anything definite. Okay, yes, thanks for all your comments. And I mean, I of course agree fully that if you include all those issues, the wide angle effects then gets very, very difficult. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess if, if we want to talk more about um, what we did for the power spectrum, then I guess we'll leave this for, uh, for later. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Great. Thank you. So now we have uh, Julian. Yes, hello. Hi, Roy. Hi, Julian. Very nice talk. Um, uh, kind of in a similar direction, um, as you already a uh, little bit hinted towards, so uh, do you also have an idea of um, how difficult or how problematic the window function will be? Because usually in a realistic server, you will have like, I don't know, uneven sky coverage, cut sky, masks, and so on. And uh, dealing with all of these, they will also probably induce some spurious uh, systematics uh, that can create these, uh, yeah, odd multiples or imaginary participles. Good question, Julian. And I'm aware of work that's been done for the power spectrum by people like Florian Beutler and others, looking at the dipolar contamination from the window function. And I think, I'm not sure if, if he and others have explicitly pointed out that this would contaminate the dipole I'm talking about, but it obviously would. And I'm kind of trying to understand that stuff because window functions are things I've tried to avoid in my life with some regrets, but a lot of relaxation as a consequence. But yes, that's, that's absolutely something that should also be done. I, I should have had a list of more caveats. I just highlighted what seemed to me the main one, but you're quite right, the window function. In the case of intensity mapping, the window function issue is, is much less of a problem. Uh, in fact, intensity mapping people tell me they don't have a window function, so it, it's it's a different issue altogether from spectroscopic surveys. So that might be that might be the place to start. Um, but, but but certainly for for galaxy surveys, the window function is something that has to be dealt with, and it would have to build on the work that's been done in the case of the power spectrum which looks to me like it's still early stage work. I don't think um, that that uh, idea has been applied practically to data yet, but I might be wrong. So in your in your uh, signal to noise forecast, you didn't consider any of this either, right? No, no, no. This is really naive Fisher forecast stuff. Yeah, it's with without the, the observational systematics the observational window, if you like. What, what we did include, of course, is the, the, the noise. And in the case of 21 centimeter mapping, we included telescope beam effects and the foreground cleaning effects, but, but all sorts of other systematics have not been addressed. 
So they will all degrade the signal to noise. But simulations and observations should help to counter that somewhat. It's just a question of who can be bothered putting enough energy in to trying to measure something that someone else thinks might be interesting. Um, so this is kind of marginal maybe, but um, we'll see. Okay, thanks. So just as you, as you um, asked the question, Julian, I was reminded the, by the fact that I think you're one of the people who uses the word weak field for this leading order correction I'm talking about. So that, that's another way of putting it, if I understand you correctly, that because we're neglecting the potential, the Sachs-Wolf type effects, we're treating them as very small, so we're treating it as a weak field effect. So I see some people also refer to this as weak field. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? I don't see any raised hands, but you can also, I mean, just go ahead. Anybody has one? Okay, so, <clears throat> Roy, uh, thanks for the great talk. <laughs> I really enjoy it. So, uh, I mean, it's amazing that, uh, you know, you, you, you've you been really uh, making a lot of progress in the second order calculations. Uh, so what, what you know, in, in what area with all these second order calculations and the observational detection in the coming years, uh, what will be the, uh, the most, what will be the area that has the most uh, the impact, the second order calculation has the biggest impact in our understanding what, what what's your thought on that oh that's a tough question <laughs> you're talking about relativistic effects in general yeah I, I i'm sure yeah i mean in the coming years with this uh, SAA and uh, next generation surveys we measure large distance effect in the power spectrum by spectrum in various probes and so on so uh uh while we the what will be the, the most important physical quantity we learn out of this uh, calculations, observations? So I think the, you know, the answer to your question depends on, on, on who you are and what you're thinking about. So if, like me, you're interested in, in relativistic effects from a theoretical curiosity, then you'd have one answer, but if uh, you're a more realistic person and you try to think what would your friends who are really doing real work with simulations and observations, what would they think is the most important? So if, if I think as a, as a more realistic person, you know, what, what, is, what has got the most chance of, of making an impact amongst the, the teams who actually make these surveys possible, the people who do the simulations and the observations and the data analysis? then I probably would say that, that um, near the top of that list should be measurements of FNL. Because I think the relativistic effects, if ignored, will certainly bias the measurements of FNL. There's no debate about that because FNL, well, the local FNL, I mean, that is an ultra large scale effect. It's already ultra large scale, it wasn't invented by relativistic theorists who like to talk about large scale effects. It's there already. <laughs> Nobody disputes it. And it's, um, so I would think that's, that's a key target. And if you look at the analysis in the literature, a lot of it's using the power spectrum. So it suffers from plane parallel approximation, which certainly breaks down on those kind of scales. Uh, Fourier space, no lensing, all of those things. You know, and I would, I've been arguing for a long time for using the angular power spectrum as the only way to go for FNL and doing multi-tracer in particular using the angular power spectrum as the only way to detect it and, and actually measuring the bias on your measurements from neglecting lensing and neglecting Doppler effect and so on. It doesn't seem to have made any kind of impact, but I think ultimately effectively when it comes closer to the time of trying to really measure FNL, people are gonna to have to actually do it properly <laughs> because indications are that the bias on your measurement is in many cases beyond one sigma. Uh, 
And as you would naturally expect it because the relativistic effects behave very much like the FNL. We recently did a paper in, in which we were, we claim that um, bispectrum measurements of local FNL could be in Euclid, could suffer a bias of FNL five equals five in the measurement if you neglect all the relativistic effects. Now, of course, the problem with our analysis, we don't include lensing because it's Fourier and we've got flat sky approximation. So that's, that can't be trusted, but it just gives an indication. So I would say that's the key thing, but I think there are many others and uh, I'm aware of the, the stuff you've been doing, for example, the, the relativistic effects in lensing. So that's the other place, my second and last example, I'm talking too much, sorry, but this is my last one. Something that you've been hammering on and that is that lensing is relativistic. You know, there might be some people in the, our community who say, no, it's not, but I don't know where they, where they learned that. I don't know what planet that holds on. Lensing is relativistic. There is no Newton, Newtonian lensing. There's no such thing. Anyway, so lensing is inherently relativistic and relativistic corrections to lensing, given the importance of lensing, I think are also important. You know, unfortunately, most of the lensing stuff is coming from the small scales, and that's probably where most of the problems are, and most of the unreliability of weak lensing lies. But there must be large-scale effects where the kind of things that you've been doing with your collaborators. So that would be the other thing I'd, I'd imagine. Thanks a lot. Great. Do we have any other questions? There's still some time for one question if somebody wants. No. Good. Well, then, if that's the case, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much, Roy. That was great. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Hermes and Joel, for inviting me. Super. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and have a good day.